Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part time musician who wants to go full time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. On the Profitable Musician Show, we give you practical tips and strategies to increase the income you're already making and tap into new streams so you can create more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. We also help you think like a business owner so you can keep more of the money that you make. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, author of the best-selling book, The Musician's Profit Path, and host of the popular Profitable Musician Summit. And as you can probably tell, I am obsessed with helping musicians like you to build a rock-solid fan base and income foundation so you can fund the music you are driven to create, share your message with the world, and fulfill your God-given purpose as a musician without stressing out about where your next dollar is going to come from. You've got the talent. You just need the marketing and business tools to take it to the next level. Now let's dive in to the Profitable Musician Show. Welcome, everyone. This is Brie Noble, and I am excited to be here with Jessica Peresta. We are going to talk about her journey. We're going to talk about how she started making money with the things that she automatically, you know, did well. And that's going to be really, really helpful for you guys, because I know that you guys all have skills and knowledge that you are probably not monetizing. So, of course, that's what this show is about. But before we get there, I'd love to hear, Jessica, just like how you know how you got started in music um what was your journey from there to where you are today yeah thank you so much for having me on the podcast i've loved connecting with you and i'm so excited to be here today so my musician story started at six years old i would say Uh, my homeroom teacher wasn't my music teacher in school but my homeroom first grade teacher had a piano in her classroom and she would just kind of always play it for us which is kind of you know odd because you don't really hear that happening much but i remember sitting behind this upright piano and hearing her play jolly old saint nicholas and my dad and i can't remember the stories of so long ago, but I know he got a piano that was being given away and just kind of put it in our home. And I remember always walking by it like, well, why do we have this? Nobody plays it. And I was determined to learn how to play it. And so I came home that day from school and just kind of tinkered around and learned the melody of Jolly Old St. Nicholas. Was it perfect? You know, I was six years old, but my mom was like, did your teacher teach that to you? And I said, no. And did you watch her play it? No. She's like, what? And so I kind of told her, no, she just played it for us in class. So anyways, long story short, I got in piano lessons and music became a passion of mine pretty much right away. Took me through college. I started as a piano performance major and then I switched to music education my sophomore year and then also play clarinet and did that all the way through college as well. Orchestra and band and all the things. And so I started my career as an elementary music teacher, but also taught private lessons and was a piano accompanist. I did a million and one things because that's how my personality is. I feel like I probably say yes to too many things. But so um, I started at a school that hadn't had a music program for seven years and basically helped build it back up from scratch. I had no resources, no instruments. And um, so right out of college, that's where I started. And so after there, we moved to a new state. My school was closing. It just kind of like all the stars aligned. And I took a break to, we moved to a new state and I got recertified to teach. And I kept having family members and friends say, oh, it'd be so nice if you could teach my child piano. And I was like, well, I don't live near you. And or friends that were in the state I was just in who I had taught piano lessons to their child. And I said, well, why don't I, you know, like, it's just so easy. Why don't I just develop an online piano course? Like, it's so simple, you know. Anyway, so I met a friend who was an entrepreneur, totally different niche than um, I'm in right now. But she was kind of giving me some ideas of how to start an online business and basically about how, you know, how I could build a website and then um, a blog. And I didn't know I didn't know what any of that stuff meant. 
you know, it was like totally new to me. I have no business background. I, I didn't even really know much about online businesses. I mean, I know I go to websites to look for things, but I never thought about the what it's like and how to build a business. And so I developed an online piano course and that's kind of how I started then a blog that went along with that. Then I kept thinking about my story of my elementary music teacher journey. And I knew music teachers were out there who maybe not the same exact story as me, but had similar stories of, I don't know what to do because I have no resources or how do I start or how do I teach music? Just needing tips and ideas. So I just started developing my blog to kind of serve that audience as well. And then a membership site was launched in a course, in a book. And now I have two podcasts and I'm doing a hundred things. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You, like I said, when we were talking before, like you sound like me, you've got all the things, right? You know, the two podcasts, the book. I mean, we, I have this exact same thing. I have actually three podcasts, but one, my, one of the podcasts now is completely almost entirely run by someone on my team. So I have two podcasts I run. I have a book, I have a you know, uh, everything, a membership, a course, like exactly like that. So, you know, when we are multi-passionate, we're excited about what we're doing and we feel like there's just so many things we want to share, like that can happen. I'm just curious before we dive into all the specifics, like, do you feel like that's been good or do you feel like you're like splintered in a million directions and, and you need to really double down and focus on one thing now? Yeah, so I invested in some online business courses to kind of help me determine because I am multi-passionate and I am kind of like squirrel syndrome, I guess you could say. I want to do all the things, but I also know I could, but I also know it's not really effective. Like, you know, if you speak to, if you're trying to speak to all the people, you're not really speaking to anyone because your message gets blurried and people are like, well, what do you do even though you do all the things so with that said i think it is good when you're starting out for me anyways it was good for me to kind of focus on a lot of different things because that helped me to determine even though i'm good at this and i like this part of my business i don't know if i want to continue that forever and i think that's okay i could do that but i'm going to let that part go so i can narrow in and really focus on who i really want to serve and the offerings I really want to serve and really focus in on that well. So, yeah. So you can do it all, but it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's a good point to like have that time of exploring because I'm big on multi multiple income streams because of the fact and I point out constantly now because of COVID that like if you're focused on one income stream and that one disappears, you're screwed. So it's good to have a bunch of different things you're doing at first, but then you can like double down on one and be like, this is the one I absolutely love. It's already growing. You know, you don't want to just double down on a thing that you haven't tested yet to see if it's working. So obviously you did that. You tested all the things and you're like, now I really feel passionate about this thing. I'm going to go in this direction. Um, and maybe you still bring in a little bit of income from those other things. Maybe you still have a few piano students, you know, it's not like you're going to totally shut it down, but if you're going to focus on helping teachers, you're going to put all of your energy and focus in that area because that's what you love. So I love that you're, you know, you're bearing that out through your story. Um, I wanted to go back to when you first started being a music teacher, you know, you're obviously very resourceful, very scrappy and stuff. How, how did you start? Like, what did you, what did you use when there wasn't, you know, we always create these courses for things that we wish we had, right? When we started. So what did you use to figure out how to start teaching music when there wasn't anything to guide you? Oh gosh, it, it was really hard. And I just want to be honest about that because first of all, as a brand new teacher, you've learned all the things in college. I did my student teaching. I thought I, but I thought I would walk into a classroom that had resources waiting for me to kind of fall back on, or maybe the teacher before me would have left some stuff or whatever. No, it was not that way. So what I started with, honestly, and I encourage the teachers I work with is every kid has a body. So if you don't have instruments, do body percussion. And then I also started them singing. We did a lot of singing because I also say every child has a voice. And so 
I didn't let it stop me that, oh, I don't have instruments or there's no books to teach with or I don't have the latest technology. I just started with what I had, which was get these kids singing, get them up and moving, get them exploring their bodies by doing different body percussion, which is patting, clapping, snapping, that kind of stuff. Then I did find in the cabinet some old like textbooks from like the early 90s. And I knew they were very outdated and I didn't want to use the CDs to go, yes, CDs, to go along with them. But I pulled them out of the cabinets and I remember sitting on my living living room floor and just scattering them around me and looking through these books and pulling the the songs or activities I thought would really work with my students after I got to know my students not the students down the street but my kiddos and I really pulled out the the songs I thought would work and then from there the next year I was able to start building up and go okay I know I have these resources to work or these songs and activities to work with now what do I need so then I would go to various workshops professional development opportunities and buy new resources but I used my own money a lot up front that's the honest truth. I was able to finally get a stipend like two years down the road to finally purchase my first set of instruments, which was rhythm sticks because they were the most inexpensive thing. And then I just slowly started building the program up from scratch. So it did break my heart when my school was announced it was closing. And then um, we found out we were moving anyways, but it was a labor of love. And it really has helped me transition to online business because I know that Everything, everything, there are, of course, exceptions to the rule. But for me, things don't just happen magically right away. It takes a lot of work, a lot of pivoting, a lot of trial and error and seeing what works, what didn't work. And that's exactly what happened in my classroom was it was overwhelming. What do I do if I don't have anything? Like, what do I do? But it was just getting the kids singing and interested in music. And that was what created a passion for music that I still get emails to this day from some of those students of, I went and did middle school music or high school music, or some of them became music majors in college. Um, it's really neat to know, like, I helped plant that seed, you know? And so, yeah, it, it was tough. <laughs> yeah, now you're helping tons of other people plant that seed. So that's the ripple effect, which is so cool. And I love, you know, my husband's a professor, and I love when the students come back and are like, you know, I did this because of you. I went on to get a, you know, a d degree in English and now I'm teaching English because I took your literature class or whatever. So, you know, it's such a rewarding thing as a teacher. And I love that you're taking that mindset into online business. And I think that's why so many people like dabble and, and, and fail and then give up because they haven't taken that mindset of, yeah, I'm going to have to try a bunch of things. I'm going to, I might have to pivot. I might have to, you know, I'm going to have to be building. I probably have to keep reinvesting. Like you said, like I had to invest my own money in things that should have been paid for by the district because you're passionate about helping kids. And it's the same thing with online. Like, you know, I didn't pay myself for several years when I started because I knew that this thing could be bigger than that. And I, I needed to make it bigger than that. And, and so, you know, I think that's why you've been successful online is because you already had that mindset. So I wanted to plant that in the listeners that like, just know that like, if you have a course idea and you try it out and, you know, only a few people buy or, you know, nobody buys or whatever. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means it might need some changing and tweaking and, and all that stuff um, before it really, really works. Mm -hmm. um, so from what you said about the, about the school and what you did, I love that you like, you know, you found the things that was going to work for your class and then you build on that. And what's great about being able to offer what you do online is that the teachers that are taking your membership have a head start. They don't have to do that. You know, they can just take what you have and then they can build on it and not feel so overwhelmed in the beginning, which is what's great about, you know, online courses and memberships and stuff. So what do you what do you offer in there? Yeah, I that was my goal was in, the, in fact, in my messaging, I say I want to help you go from feeling overwhelmed to confident. And so I don't know if you've heard of, um, not to name drop, but Stu McLaren's Tribe of course. Um, course. Actually, okay, I, so. I took Tribe. It was the, oh, it was yeah. the very first, it was the very first um, iteration of Tribe when I actually opened up my academy as a monthly membership. Before that, it was only a yearly membership. So yeah, I was okay. a Tribe generation. <laughs> okay, well, so you totally get where I'm coming from. And I had a, okay, so I did have a previous membership site for music teachers. 
I wouldn't say it was terrible, but I, I will be honest. I did not know what I was doing. It was just kind of like, oh, I'll just kind of, you know, offer this or, oh, I'll, what can I do this week? Oh, I'll give them a lesson plan. Hey, maybe I'll just do a sporadic Facebook live. And it was just kind of all over the place. And so retention was terrible. Um, and I don't blame any of them. Like, it was just kind of like, what is going on in here? So that like going back to the word passion, that passion was still there. It's never gone away. And I knew it was needed. I have, I've been, you know, online. I like to kind of be like a silent listener of just kind of listening to what others are saying and what are they needing and what are they asking for? And I was like, oh, it's so needed, but how do I do this? So after figuring it out, I knew I wanted to offer completely a year's worth done for you lesson plans where I tell teachers, if you come in and you don't want to sit down and plan at all here, mm -hmm. but I also in there say, I also know you're going to come in with different resources and other online programs you probably already use, or your district has said, use this curriculum. So I also show you how to use what I offer and in conjunction with what you have too. But along with the done for you lesson plans, there's implementation videos, there's planning resources, but we also do monthly mentorship calls. We offer one on one coaching in there for various um, people, depending on um, what they need. It might be new teacher calls. It might be if you've transitioned from secondary music or whatever. And then we do have an active Facebook community where I'm going live consistently. We do members of the month. Um, we just started doing um, member shares where once a month, a, a member from our community will share something that's working for them in their classroom, whether it's with teaching, classroom management, something with work home life balance. Um, I know I'm probably missing stuff, but yeah, that that's the main thing. It's just offering them support and in various ways. And I also know that for me, I really thought about the different types of learners I'll have in the community. Some want the video, some are there just for the community, some are there just for the lesson plans and you don't see them in the community. So when they pop up and ask a question, you're like, who is this? <laughs> you know, it's like, so everybody is there for different purposes and they all learn different ways, but we're always strategizing of how to create this membership and keep it going. Because for me, it is about bringing new people in. Of course it is, but I want the people who are in there currently to know, I am 100% in, like I am here to serve you with whatever you need. And so we do have a pretty good retention rate. You're always gonna see people leave, but it's really cool because this last launch this summer, no, um, sorry, this winter, I two people came back who had left previously. And it, so it's not always, they're not always leaving because it's, you know, don't take it personally. It's not about you. Um, and I saw a really cool quote and I cannot remember, of course, now where I heard it or saw it, but it was, it was relating it back to a college course of don't take offense when people are, are leaving your community. It's not you. It's maybe that they have gotten what they need from it. And so you don't want to have kids that keep repeating a college course. That means you're doing something wrong. They're not getting from point A to Z. So if members are leaving, it's various reasons. It could be just they're in a busy season. They don't have time to apply what they're learning, but they may come back. So that, um, yeah, I love having a membership site because I also have a course. But I, for me personally, I love the membership model because it's ongoing support. And I feel like I'm just, I, I don't know, I love showing up you know, and serving like that. So, yeah, we are so similar in that way. I, I had my membership and then I decided I wanted to do a course and it just didn't resonate with me because people were on a different wavelength. Like they weren't, they weren't wanting to come and get help at the calls and stuff like that. They just wanted to like go through the thing and complete it. And I was like, no, you know, I love the membership aspect because of the fact that I get to get to know them over the year. I mean, people I have seen, you know, through multiple albums that they've created, you know, completely transitioning their business to different things. Like, it's just amazing to see people grow that are in for years and years uh, in the Academy. And we've now been around for almost six years. So I totally get what you're saying about that. I love the membership model and we do like a lot, almost everything that you mentioned for yours as well. And um, it's just, it's, they need that support. You know, they don't, it's hard to find a group of people that are doing what you do, especially with teachers 
because, you know, there's only one music teacher per school or per district or whatever, you know, so the people that, you know, maybe that are doing it, in, they're far away. So it's great to have that way, you know, people way for people to commune, um, especially now when we've had to keep everything so virtual um, for musicians, you know, you can't even do like meetups and stuff locally. So it's that's what's so great about the membership model. Um, so I wanted to ask you about doing all of this while also being a mom of three, another, I feel like we are the same person. <laughs> I, I am a, a mom of two and I started all this when my kids were younger. Um, now they're so self-sufficient. One just turned 18. The other one is 12, but when they were littler, you know, it was hard. It was hard to, to organize that. And I personally have kept up the same like habits that I did when they were little so I could get work done. I got up super early and all that. And now I'm like, wow, I have so much time now because I kept these habits up and they don't take up very much. The kids don't take up very much time, but I would love to know, like, how have you been able to balance all of this as a mom? And are you still doing any like local teaching of any kind or is this this all online? No, I'm only online now. I, I kind of have been thinking about going back to teaching just part time. But with that said, I love just being able to show up and serve online and have my own flexibility in my schedule. Yeah. So how, how have you how have you balanced this from starting out, uh, you know, as a mom? How old are your kids now? So I have three boys and they are 11, almost nine. Our eight year old will be nine in May and then six. And so balancing when I started my business, they were baby. Gosh, now I can't remember. Baby, maybe like two and four or three and five. So very little. And it was like a little plate of parenting there. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) But yeah, it was like. You know, so when I hear people say, oh, I can't start a business because I'm a parent and I'm like, "Mm," you know, I feel like everybody, not everybody that came out wrong, but anybody can use an excuse to not do something. And for me, I have been a work outside the home mom. Uh, My I worked when I taught my oldest until he was two and then a stay at home mom and now a work from home mom. And I can tell you all three are equally hard, but equally rewarding at the same time. And so working from home, like you said, Building a membership site from scratch, like when your kids are awake or when it's summertime and they're not in school and it's just like they're wanting you to entertain them. And you're like, oh, my gosh, how am I supposed to do all this? I feel like, first of all, moms, if you're listening to this and you are a mother that or a parent at all, you um, it's OK to have multiple passions. And what I mean by that is you can be passionate about your work and being a mom. And for me, I I knew I needed that for myself. And I knew that I, my dreams, one of my dreams is being a mother. I love it. They come first, like my family is everything. But also I know that I am also passionate about music and um, wanted to help serve in a business model. And so when I, when they were little, little, that is like you already mentioned, I got up before they woke up, which I am a morning person, but you know, when that alarm clock goes off at four 30 or five, yep. there's certain days you're like, I don't want it. But I remember those quiet mornings sitting, you know, in the living room, just with my laptop open and a cup of strong coffee and really kind of going through building this membership site out. How am I going to do this? Like at this point, my website was there. I ha- so that part was there. I did have a blog, but my podcast was newish. Everything's kind of a stepping stone. You know, I think when people come into online business, it's it's overwhelming if you just look at all the things instead of taking it one step at a time. And everything doesn't have to get done right away. And you will, like I said, learn as you go of, hmm, I have a blog, but I kind of want a podcast now. Okay, I have a website. Do I like this website or do I want something different? And so I would get it before they were awake. The during nap time, like let's say my youngest, the baby was still napping, that I would strategically put a movie on sometimes at that time in the middle of the day to have like maybe a, it may have been only an hour, but an hour or two hour block of time. And then I would work when they went to bed, but not every night because I knew I still needed me time and I still needed, I have a husband, we still needed to spend time together. And so, and then maybe I don't like working on the weekends, but when I was working when they were little, there would be times I would have to work on the weekend, like maybe just like a two hour block of time. But it was amazing how much time 
I was able to get things done because I, I love the time blocking method and really like if it's on the calendar and I'm blocking out a two hour section of time here, stuff's going to get done. I like turn my phone over. I don't have any distractions around me. And I just like, and I have a to-do list sitting in front of me of what I need to get yeah, done. That's what I was going to ask. Yes. That's the thing. It's like, you can set aside the time, but if you sit there and go, okay, now what I'm going to, you know, work mm-hmm. on right now. So you mm-hmm. had everything all set up. So it's like go time. Oh yeah. Like it would be like, okay, so today as I'm building, like, let's use the membership site as an example. Okay. So today I'm really going to focus on building out the lesson plans, maybe just for the first month. And then when I launch, I'll just kind of build them out as we go. Okay. The um, the next morning, maybe it's really focusing on adding things to the calendar that I'm going to share with my membership site, which takes, you know, all those little tasks take long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really Blocking out time, but also, like you said, having an outline of or bullet points or on your calendar of what you really need to accomplish that day. And then once it's done, it's like, okay, well, that I was really able to accomplish more than I thought I could in that two hours. So, yeah, it is very possible to work when you have small kids. Yep, you just have to be uh, super yeah. intentional like mm-hmm. you were. Mm-hmm. And that's why you were able to get it done. Totally. Do you have now that you've been going for a while, do you have anyone helping you on your team? Or are you still just doing all this yourself? I have, I don't know even whether to call her a virtual assistant, but she's more of a community manager. Uh, She is kind of like my go-to person. So it's really neat because uh, this person, her name's Katie, and she was one of my founding members of my membership site. She has been with me from kind of day one and we've kind of connected. She was kind of in the Facebook group, like, developing hey i developed a a planner i'm just does anybody want it here or um would go live just which is fine with me like just hosted facebook lives hey the new teachers in here i want to just offer support i didn't ask her to do this and she wasn't even doing it to be like look at me she just has a heart for serving and so Mm -hmm. i i kind of was like i knew i was at the point where i needed to hire someone else because i was like I needed to delegate some stuff off because I was a party of one for three and a half years and it was like, it's time. And so I kind of just emailed her one day and was like, hey, would you like to maybe talk about coming on? I'll give you specifics, but coming on my team and I can give you some tasks to do. She was so excited. She's been with me now for five months and it has been amazing. (laughs) So I'm like, yes, like having you don't realize like I'm going back to the mundane tasks of little things like responding to emails or creating Canva quotes or gosh, I don't know, just even going in the Facebook group. I have a free Facebook group too. And just going in there and just keeping the community going, all those things that are very important tasks, but I didn't realize how much time it was taking from me to be able to really focus on the work I needed to do. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I so agree with that. I, my community manager is the same way. Like she was not a founding member, but she was a very early member And, you know, she's been with me now since 2017. So I think you've got, you know, you've got a lot ahead of you with Katie because, you know, it was, it's worked out really well for me, for sure. Um, I'm curious, probably because you had all these systems in place from when your kids were little, once COVID happened and your kids were home and all that, were were you able to handle that pretty easily because you kind of already had some of this with having little kids home anyway? Yeah, I knew I it was just going to be crazy for a little bit. But what I tell people about building an online business is at, for upfront, it's a lot of work to well, it's the not just building out your business, but the taking the trainings and the like how do I email people? Like what do I do on social media? All the things you got to figure out. But it was really cool because I was at the point in my business where I wouldn't say things were just coasting, but like I still have to show up and work every day. But I was able to say I have to help them with their schoolwork through this hour to this hour. So back to time blocking. And so I had to kind of like just readjust my calendar. I had to move certain things around, like where maybe I would have daytime meetings or showing up on my membership. I had to be very clear with my members, too, of I'm going to be able to show up during these hours now instead of these hours and just. I had to move things around, but yes, having those systems in place when they were little bitty, once COVID hit, don't get me wrong, it was very hard juggling it all with them being home again, but it was also like, man, I really do have some good systems in place that I'm very grateful that I set up up front, and it really was helpful. Yeah, but I'm sure your members understood because they were going through the same thing, right? You know, suddenly they all had kids home too if they were, you know, parents, so... uh, 
And one other question about COVID, because I feel like it's mm -hmm. changed, especially so many things for education. Did you find that people needed different things now that they were having to do stuff all online? Did you like teach your teachers how to use Zoom and all that stuff? Because sometimes they weren't getting that kind of support from their district. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so ironically, my membership site was a year old when, no, not even a year old, almost a year old when COVID hit because it was launched in the summer. And I went, okay. <laughs> so it was new for all of us. You know, this was like, you know, unexpected. And I went, not that my membership site wouldn't still serve them, but I knew like the lesson plans, for example, it was just created for in-person teaching. And I went, some of these aren't going to be helpful for what they need. So I went back through all school year this year. What I've been doing is saying, if you teach virtually, modify this lesson this way. Mm -hmm. If you teach on a cart, modify this way. But also, gosh, it was, there was so much mindset set stuff that these teachers are dealing with, with some of them were at risk of losing their job as a music teacher, especially mm -hmm. when teaching virtually. And yeah, like you said, the not knowing how to use Zoom, um, it, it's just like the simplest things that we think everybody just knows that they needed help with, like the little things like that or navigating Google Classroom or how do I upload a lesson plan for my students to see. And ironically, you know, it's just kind of cool to see how all the stars have aligned. I started my master's in educational technology this spring. And so like being able to kind of like what I'm learning, I'm like, ooh, I can tell them to do this. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's so helpful. And it wasn't even for that reason. It wasn't like, okay, the teachers are in COVID, so I'm going to get a master's in this. I, that had mm -hmm. been my plan all along. So it's like, what in the world? So, that's um, so cool. Yeah, there's yeah. so many things they had to learn. I mean, Canvas, Google Classroom, you know, how to do breakout rooms, like all the things that suddenly they were forced to learn. So that's really cool that that, that that happened that way. So you're getting your master's in educational technology. What's the, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, twofold. One is to kind of give me more skills in how to help the teachers with integrating technology into what they do in a pre or po I mean, a current or post COVID world, because even if they're in the classroom, they're being asked to use technology more and more and not just like, here's a technology platform, use it, but principals more and more are asking teachers to integrate technology into what they're already doing. And for music educators, it's kind of tricky in how to do that. But also it's helping me tremendously in my online business with, um, systems and website. It, I mean, it goes through a lot of some of the stuff I'm already aware of, but it doesn't mean like I'm always about refresh, you know, refreshers, but we do podcasts, blogs, websites, all kinds of stuff, but it, they relate it back to helping K to 12 teachers. And so I know for me, that's going to be my business, um, hopefully forever is how to help K to 12 teachers. And so it's not just learning how to use technology, but it's basically it helps you with even like coaching and mentoring and I looked at the degree plan and all the courses it described of what it would be doing. And it's a completely online degree. I went every single one of those courses is something I am actually excited to do mm -hmm. and to learn about. And so, um, yeah, that was why I knew I wanted to get a master's and it was going, do I do music or do I do something with education? And when I saw educational technology, I went, this is the one that makes sense. And that's, that's kind of how that happened. Yeah, that makes total sense. So I love that you were just tripling down on music educators. And I believe, I'm trying to remember for sure, but I think that your clubhouse club is called Music Educators of Clubhouse. Is that right? Let me look because I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that you're, you know, you're like calling out your perfect people. Yeah. Let me open that real you're quick. Smart. Um, oh, yeah. So my clubhouse room is just music. Edu yeah. I have a club called the Elementary Music Teacher Club. Oh, got it's, it. OK. Yeah. And the room is called Music Educators of Clubhouse. Music Education Chat. Got it. OK. Yeah. Cool. I, I love that. Yeah. So if you guys are on Clubhouse and you're a music educator, definitely check out that. She has rooms going on at least once a week. Uh, and then let them know how else they can connect with you. You have a podcast, you have a website, membership site, all that stuff. Yeah. So you can find me at the domestic musician.com. And then I have a podcast called the elementary music teacher podcast, another podcast called learn music together podcast. And then you can find all the things on my website. And then also I'm on Instagram is probably where I'm the most active and just at Jessica Peresta and at clubhouse, same thing, Jessica Peresta. So I would love to connect with any of you just reach out and let me know how we can connect. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. I know that people hearing about your journey and how you took what you learned and have used it to help so many other educators and that, you know, whole ripple effect. I know that that is going to be really encouraging and inspiring to them. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've loved this conversation. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.